today we are starting a new series. And this series we have been looking forward to and planning for, for a pretty long time, actually. Um, it's called Phase to Phase, Growing in Christ. And uh, over the next five weeks, we're going to talk about the different phases in our spiritual development. Um, and the goal really is to help each of us individually follow Jesus, but not only us as individuals follow Jesus, but also as individuals for us to help others follow Jesus. So throughout this whole series, you're going to feel this tension of uh, part of the conversation being about how does this apply to me, but also part of the conversation being how does this apply to me helping others? Okay, so all the whole time, it's like the right and the left. All the whole time is going to be happening. And, uh, but this process of helping others follow Jesus, this process of uh, we ourselves following Jesus, uh, this is called discipleship. In Matthew chapter 28, Jesus, before he ascended, he said, go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Make disciples of all nations, okay? And uh, uh, this is really, the scripture, by the way, it's called the Great Commission, okay? If you ever hear anybody say the Great Commission, these verses right here are, are what's being talked about. A disciple of Jesus is, a, is disciplined as a follower, a student, and a, an apprentice of Jesus, All right, so whenever we say a a disciple of Jesus, a disciple of Christ, we're talking about someone who is a follower or a student or an apprentice of Jesus, okay? So whenever Jesus calls his disciples, these are people who are coming uh, to, to literally, I mean, live with Jesus, follow him, to learn his ways, to learn how he approaches life, and so we're called to that as well. Our mission here at Northwood Church is to build Christ-centered communities that help people know God, grow in Christ, and go in the power of the Holy Spirit until Jesus returns. And this is really the process of making disciples, all right? Discipleship. So we are called to make disciples uh, in a few different ways, by sharing the gospel, teaching obedience to Christ, all right, and modeling a life of faith so that others can also become disciple makers and fulfill Jesus's commission. Now, this word discipleship, if you've been around church for any amount of time, you've more than likely heard this. You, you might have heard it uh, said in, in an ambiguous way, kind of like, what does that actually mean? Uh, discipleship, discipleship can kind of become one of these trends. Uh, <sighs> It can kind of become one of these words that just gets said a lot. But it doesn't land on anything. It's like, hey, we're disciples of Christ. And people are like, yes. And then it's like, we should all be disciple makers. And it's like, sure, you know, whatever that really means. And, and what happens is we begin to say the words a lot, but we're not actually doing anything about it. So it's like, we, we might all agree that we should be disciple makers because we're in church and that's what you're supposed to say. But when, like, when it comes down to it, if we were to look back in our life in the last six months or six years, could we actually say that as believers, that if you are a believer, that you are, are actually participating in that process of discipleship personally and with other people? Uh, we're, this kind of one of the things we're gonna be talking about. Uh, we believe that discipleship is intended to be done relationally. So there's different ways to disciple people or be discipled. There's discipleship in regards to, I mean, this is a part of discipleship right here, being in a church service, Uh, uh, being in a classroom setting. That's another way that you can be discipled, all right? Uh, You could be discipled one-on-one with someone discipling you or you discipling someone else, right? It could be in small groups, uh, nowadays, there's a lot of people being discipled through even, I mean, honestly, podcasts and different things are discipling people. People are students of and are following people online. So discipleship is a much broader word than just one specific word. Some people, whenever they say discipleship, they're only thinking about Bible study. Like that's, that's what true discipleship is, is Bible study. Well, it's bigger than that. It really is. It, it's a broad, it's a lifestyle, okay? So, but we think that it should be done relationally. This is not like a just come to church on a Sunday morning type of thing, okay, for an individual. It's it's bigger than that. But it's also, let's say that there's somebody in your life that you believe is far from God, and then you really want them to, to know God like you know God. And if your mindset is, I just need to get them to church, and that's where that's going, going to happen, that is a trap. Church might be a great component. It might be an easy open door, 
come into a building like this, and that, that could be great, and that could be part of it, absolutely. But if, if your mindset of how you could impact someone in regards to discipling them or helping them to know God is only about bringing them to church and let the pastor say it, you've actually been limited in your ability to, to advance the kingdom of God in your life, like in, in order to, to reach more people. And this is a big deal in our culture. A lot of people feel like I just don't know enough to disciple others or, you know what I'm saying? Like there's a limitation there. And a lot of times, did you know that what you think in those moments determines your actions? A, 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 a kid in school, if they believe that they just can't do something, that, that's a limitation in their growth, in their education. Well, you know what? Uh, you know, my daddy was like this. I'm like this. It's just the way that it is. You know what I'm saying? Our family never did this, I, so therefore it's just, it's not, in, it's not in my genes. You know, there's a limitation there. Somebody says something to them and, and, and demeans them, and then they actually believe that, and, and it limits them. The way that we think and the way that we approach things, uh, and especially in discipleship, if you feel like you're just too dumb to do that, the enemy has got you right where he wants you. He's got you in a place where you cannot be fruitful and multiply. You know, I read Genesis, and, and part of that I, I apply to what it means to be a disciple of Christ, that we are called to be fruitful and multiply in, spiritually. And so if you believe that you can't do that or you're not called to do that, then you will sit in a chair on a Sunday morning, <laughs> potentially for the rest of your life, and not produce fruit in the kingdom of God because you just don't feel like you can. And that's a lie. We're all called to this, y'all. We're all called to it. So we need, uh, as disciples, we need transformation in every area of our life. Our hearts, our thoughts, our desires, our behavior, our relationships, our purpose. Every part of us as we follow Jesus is transformed. It might not all be done in a moment, but it's done potentially over a lifetime. By the way, you're never done transforming. <laughs> you never arrive I don't care if you've been saved since you were 10 and you're now you're, you're 70. It doesn't matter. We're always being formed into the image of God. And honestly, for some people, that's confusing. Some people call people hypocrites because they're not, you know what I'm saying? They're kind of missing the market. It's like, well, okay, let's, let's, let's kind of let's lower our legalistic standard here. Like, we're not talking about perfection here, but we are talking about pursuit, pursuing Jesus. And so we're all in this process. And so like phases of growth or milestones in our physical and mental development, come on, think about yourself. There's milestones in your development. Uh, there are six phases in our spiritual growth, and there's milestones that go along with those phases. Uh, throughout this series, I need you to have this picture in your mind of a child that, that is that is, you know, an embryo and then is, is born as an infant and then is a child and then grows into a young adult and then that young adult grows into a parent and that parent grows into a grandparent, right? So all of these phases have different milestones. When a child is born, all right, they, they do what they do. They check the ears and they check the, you know, they prick them and they're, you know, when we had our first child and I watched them like, flip Ariana all over the place and everything. I'm like, don't break her, you know what I'm saying? Then I realized they're, they're pretty resilient little, little beings, you know? But man, they, why? They're checking. Can they hear? Can they, can they see? You know, what's their digestion look like? And then as they get older, are they, you know, are they, are they looking around? Are they focusing? Are they, can they hear the voice of their parent? Do they respond? When are they supposed to, you know, start eating solid food and, and then walking and, and, you know, five years of age, are they able to begin to recognize and read? Are they, how, what's their social interaction look like, right? And then as you get older, as you become a young adult, there's certain things, certain milestones in life. Here's the deal. If a child or someone is not meeting those, those milestones, if they're not passing those, those tests, if you will, there's something wrong, there's something that is not developing properly, and it needs to be looked at and addressed. Here's the deal. In the church, every single one of us are in a phase. We're in, whether we're a, you know, an embryo or, or maybe we're not an embryo yet. We'll talk about that here in a second, okay? Or we're an infant or we're a child or we're a young adult in our faith, in our spiritual growth. 
And so what happens is some people are, are born again, which we'll talk about later today, what, kind of what that means. They're, they're saved. They begin to follow Jesus, and then they stop growing. So they're 40 years old in their faith, but they're still a baby, right? And so what's the milestones that people need to reach? What's gonna happen for some of you, and, and look, this isn't to demean anybody, but some of you are gonna realize that you've been a Christian, you've been in church for a very long time, but your growth is stunted, and you're actually a child whenever you've been in church for 20 years. Now, here's the deal. You could be condemned by that, but, but that's really not the right response. The Holy Spirit brings conviction because he loves us, and he says there's more for us. So for some of you, if you've been stunted in your growth for 20 years, you need to know that you can grow. It's not permanent. You can grow. God has a plan for you and can work through you to affect many people around you. But guess what? It starts here, it starts here, and, and, and then we can grow. And listen, if you have been stunted for 20 years, um, there's, there's no shame, but you do need to be humble in that. There's areas in this series for me that I'm, I'm convicted about already. Oh, Yeah. Why? Because we're all on a journey. So this isn't a hierarchical thing. Uh, you being called a child in your faith is not something that should, it's, you can't look at any of these things as being, you know, uh, 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 it's, it's a negative word or something like that. This is to spur us into uh, growing as disciples of Jesus. Y'all ready? Let's jump into today's first phase. So at some point for all of us, we did not exist. Did you guys know that? You did not exist physically. You were not here. And then we're not going there today with the birds and the bees, but you did exist. All right, everybody good. Okay, you did exist. And, but before you existed, you were not alive, right? You were not alive. And just like that in our spiritual growth, in our spiritual walk, it, 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 it's like that in our physical walk. Spiritually, we all start off spiritually dead. Come on, did that sound encouraging? Well, it's true. This is a, a person who is not yet saved, an unbeliever, a seeker, someone who is spiritually dead. And this is the first phase in this face-to-face -face conversation. Ephesians 2 says this, and you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of the world. We all started here. Every single person in this room. Clean slate, right? All spiritually dead. You were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked. Sometimes it's hard to know whether someone or even yourself is spiritually dead. In this room today, watching online, we all fall into these two categories. We are either spiritually alive or we're spiritually dead. It's pretty, it's very simple, all right, in regards to that. But identifying whether or not you are spiritually alive or spiritually dead, and also whether someone else is spiritually alive or spiritually dead, is not that easy to determine, especially in the church. Did you know that just by simply saying that you're a Christian does not mean that you are transformed, that you are, you know what I'm saying? It doesn't really mean that much. But how do we determine if someone is or isn't? I want to say this first. Um, I don't spend a lot of time trying to judge whether someone who says that they're a Christian is or isn't. Like, to be honest, I'm not God's cop. <laughs> right? um, at the end of the day, I'm not standing before God for them. I care about them, but also I don't feel a need to be judging every single person and, and, and weighing that, okay? I, I, like, it's not my responsibility to do that, but it is my responsibility as a believer in people's lives and in my own life to be aware of the health or the, where someone may be. So somebody asked me the other day, you know, how do you know if somebody's saved or not? And I'm like, well... Personally, I don't know, like, really. I mean, I can make some speculations about some things. I said, but 
I would just go, I can only go based upon their words and their actions. You know what I'm saying? Outside of that, what am I, what am I doing? And I said, and, and, but even actions, there's a, there's a little gray area there because like, uh, we're not talking about perfection here. So, hey, we're, we all still sin, right? We, we, we still fall short of the glory of God and that's why we live a life of repentance. And so I can't judge someone's salvation based off of a few actions, you know, I mean, I don't know, right? I said, but if someone says they're a Christian and they confess with their mouth and they say that, oh, okay, hey, great. However, if someone confesses that they are not a believer in Jesus, that's also pretty clear. <laughs> you know, I, I would think out of everything, that's probably the clearest. If someone says, I don't believe in Jesus, I don't believe that he is God, I believe he was a good man, or I don't believe he existed. If someone says those things, well, it gets a little bit easier to say, not in a judgmental way, but just in an honest way. And so how do we determine if someone is spiritually dead? Well, based upon their words and actions, because it reveals some things. And so some examples of people who are far from Jesus or who are spiritually dead according to the word of God I'm gonna throw out some, some names and give you some, maybe what they would say and then maybe a scripture to, to look at about this. But there are atheists, people who say, you know, I don't believe that there is a God. You can go to that next slide. An atheist, someone who says, I don't believe that there is a God. I mean, I'm, many of you have probably heard that before, right? Somebody just straight up, I don't believe that there is a God. And there's a lot of those in our culture. Uh, we're going to learn here soon that it's actually not as many as you think. But um, Psalm 14 says that the fool says in his heart, there is no God. So uh, someone who would say there is not a God, it, 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 biblically speaking, is someone who is spiritually dead. Their spirit man is not alive. All right. Uh, a, a polytheist, which we don't usually say, oh, they're a polytheist, but this is someone who believes that there are many gods, okay? Uh, you might hear him say something like, it's kind of risky to rely on one god. Like, I like to keep my options open with a lot of gods, you know? Uh, they, but they, they believe that there's a lot of different gods. Deuteronomy 4.35, to you it was shown that you might know the Lord is God. There is no other besides him. We just read scriptures in uh, Psalm 95, right? That he is the great God. There is, there's no one else. There's not other options. There's one true God. There may be other spirits. There may be other things going on. But, but as far as the preeminent God, the creator of all, there's only one. Uh, in our day, we have a lot of universalists. A lot of people who believe in one God, you know, little g or big g, <laughs> a lot of gods, but, uh, or one God, but there are many ways to that God. There's many religions. It's another word that's sort of related is whenever there's a syncretism, syncretists, people who uh, you know, kind of want to combine a lot of different religions into one and say, well, hey, whether it's Buddhist or Hindu or Christianity or Islam or whatever the case is, they're kind of all pointing to the same thing. Well, scripturally, that's not the way that it is. All right, John 14 said, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. See, Jesus said a lot of things in scripture that cancels out a lot of the modern day intellectualism because it sounds very open and freeing almost to say, well, you know what? Whatever journey you're on is fine. I'm on my, we're all in a spiritual journey. It almost sounds like we're kind of meeting in the middle. And in a day and age where we all want to love and we all want to be like, hey, you, you not come together. People do the same thing religiously uh, with different religions. And they say, it, well, it's, you're kind of saying the same thing. You know, light and darkness, you know, whatever else you want to say, you know, yin yang. However, I mean, every single religion has a different way of putting different things and, and you just got to combine it all together, and you've got this wonderful un united front, if you will. And it, it, the problem is, is Jesus didn't say that. Okay? So there's universalists. Uh, how about agnostics? People who claim no belief, which I always think is funny because it's literally impossible to claim no belief. It, it, it's like philosophically, you, 
logically, you cannot claim nothingness, complete neutrality. That in and of itself is a stance, is a belief. At the very least, it's, it's you know, trusting in your own belief, right? But they might say something like, I won't pr- pretend to know what many people are so sure of. Doesn't that sound so intellectual? Like, I, I, I was, this past week, I went and listened to a, a philosopher, uh, and he gave like a two-hour lecture. And um, he's not a believer, but he's, he's struggling with the Bible, and he's struggling with Jesus, and he's not sure about all of these things. And, and one of the things that he's committed to is to just question the questions of the questions of the questions. And I understand that because my brain kind of does the same thing. I, I question my beliefs. Like, like when I have a doubt, I'm, I'm doubtful of my doubt. Like, you know what I'm saying? So one of the greatest things I heard a, a guy say, a preacher many years ago, um, he, he kind of teaches very apologetically. And he said, um, he says, for those of you who are skeptics and, and cynics and you're struggling with faith in God, he said, uh, I just want to say one thing to you. Doubt your doubts. And it was such a freeing thing. It actually destabilized the destabilization that was happening in my heart, if that makes sense. It offset it things. It would, why? Because I had this belief system growing up that then new information began to come up against. And because simply just because it was new information, it felt like it might be true. Has it ever happened in your life? Like maybe you grew up in church and then all of a sudden you're 16 and somebody says there might not be a God and you're like, I've never heard that before because you grew up in a bubble and now that bubble's bursting. There might not be a God. It's like, well, a lot of people have thought that since the beginning. That's nothing new. So honestly, with a lot of this movement in Christianity of deconstruction, there's some people that are very prominent in the Christian circles you know, artists and, and song artists and stuff, and, and now they've, they've deconstructed from the faith, and, and people ask them, why are you deconstructing? And they, they say, well, you know what? I just couldn't get over, and they say like this very, to be honest with you, very basic theological point that they, that they just heard of recently. And it's like, oh, no. Like, that was too big of a platform for someone who has not dealt with, with these foundational things. And that's why we have a, a foundations uh, uh, discipleship track here. It's because you need to come in. If you get saved, you need to hear the basics of your faith in order logically and come up against some difficult questions. How am I saved? What does that actually mean? It's not just a feeling. Okay. It's something deeper than that. What is it grounded upon? What does it look like to be a disciple? It's why we're doing this series to come up against these things. So we are not duped into thinking that we are something that we are not, right? Cultural Christians. Hebrews 11.6, talking about agnosticism, and without faith, it is impossible to please him for whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. Faith in God is a prerequisite. It's, it's, you know, now, now, we could get kind of deep into faith and, and talk a lot about that. We don't have time to go there today. But without faith, it's impossible to please him. Without faith in God, it's impossible to believe in God. Are you going to struggle with doubts? Absolutely. But you could still begin and uh, continue to seek him. Another one's humanists. We're talking about, again, we're talking about people who are spiritually dead. And for some of you, you're like, man, oof, <laughs> I say all this stuff all the time. Humanist. It says, I have everything that I need within myself. It, it's basically trust yourself. This is big in our culture. Trust yourself. You know what I'm saying? Now, now in regards to trusting yourself g- generally, like trust yourself, not other people, there's kind of that relational trust thing. This is a little bit deeper than that. It's like trust your feelings about who God is or where he is or whether he is or isn't or trust yourself in yourself is the truth. (laughs) No, it's not. (laughs) It's not, okay? You might have a gut feeling about things, but it could be just some bad pizza as well. Um, (laughs) Jeremiah 17, thus says the Lord. Come on, man. Thus says the Lord. Curse is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength, 
whose heart turns away from the Lord. Guys, listen, anytime that somebody begins to trust in their own self, eventually they will displace God in their heart and they become God. They become God and their hearts turn away from him. There is a way that seems right in the heart of every man and in the end, in the end, it leads to death. In the end. That means that you could literally live your whole life trusting in yourself and it can be good. That's the trap of it. People think that if I start living a certain way or thinking a certain way in three to six months that I will know whether it was true or not. No, 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 no. You could be extremely successful, full of happiness your entire life because you just really were intelligent, made good choices. You knew how to do math and handle money, so therefore you had an easy life. You know what I'm saying? Maybe you just were intelligent in certain ways and, and you could be super successful, but in the end, where does it lead? So you can't judge whether or not your faith or what you believe in right now is, is the right or wrong thing based upon your current circumstances. That could be, that's a defective way of approaching whether something is true or not. Naturalism, there's naturalists, uh, people who disbelieve in the supernatural altogether. There is no spiritual. They say everything in the universe can be explained by natural processes. You ever heard somebody say, trust the science? Now, hey, we should trust science to a certain extent. I believe that we've made some great discoveries. And it's a positive thing. However, just like somebody might say, trust yourself, and, and, and they get very introspective and all that, some other people are like, hey, if I can't prove it with natural processes, I'm not going to believe it. Everything in the universe can be explained by natural processes. The problem, as Romans 1 says, for his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. So the very thing that they are saying must prove something deeper if they don't discover that, that, that gap or that crossover between the natural and the supernatural, then they say it doesn't exist. It doesn't exist. Have you met anybody like that before? It's like, where do the elements come from that are the natural processes? Well, like some people, it's, well, nothing. Explain that. Well, we just don't understand what nothing means. Okay. Explain that. Well, we can't. So the very process that you're saying would prove something you're trusting in, it doesn't prove, and so you're just saying we're missing something. That sounds like faith. <laughs> sounds like a lot of faith in a, you know what I'm saying? It's just... There's this circular logic, and eventually you find people maybe in that place that they are just so committed to believing in, in that that you're, you're, you're not going to change their mind with, with more science because they're just like, we haven't discovered it yet. It's like, all right. Naturalists. Then there are spiritualists, and these are people that believe in a lot of forms of the supernatural, you know, psychics and all sorts of things. List goes on and on and on. There's a lot of spiritualists and people that, that say maybe I'm less concerned or I'm less interested in labels, but I am spiritual. You got a lot of people that <laughs> potentially fall into this category sometimes whenever they say, um, I'm spiritual, but I'm not religious. It's like, okay. By the way, just for us Christians who we always use the word religion in a negative sense, uh, it's not always a negative word, Okay. It's, it's, a, it's a set of principles or doctrines that, that people live by, right? And so to just say I'm not religious but I'm spiritual, some people by that, what they mean is I don't follow a certain doctrine or dogma. I follow myself or I follow whatever spirit I feel is, is leading to truth. The problem with that is that they can encounter spirits who provide a sense of truth and stability for a season and lead them down the wrong path. That's why when people encounter somebody who's got, you know, they're like a, a seer or a, or a psychic or something like that, and the person tells, reads their mail, people begin to be drawn to that because they're like, man, they told me the truth. And it's like, yeah, well, that's what makes it real. <laughs> that's what makes it uh, deceptive. God, God said, like, 
Don't go to psychics. Don't talk to the dead. He didn't say you can't. He said don't. Right? Stuff is real. So spiritualists might be open to just, hey, whatever. And in that, they're kind of open to the, to the Jesus stuff as well. But hey, all of it. Colossians 2, 8, see to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world and not according to Christ. There's a lot of other spirits out there. There's a lot of stuff going on. But it leads to captivity. Another one is moralists. Again, reminder, spiritually dead. People that are spiritually dead. There's some people who are moralists. People that say, I, I just need to be a good person. People who, who feel like I've, I've done enough good things to be worthy of God's grace or whatever. They're trusting in themselves. They're trusting in their actions and what they've done to what, you know, the rich young ruler. I've done all the, I've done all the commandments, Jesus. What else you got for me? Right? And people kind of come to God like that. But some people come to God in the other way. It's like I've done too many bad things to be worthy. Worthy. I've, I've done too many. Well, you're still relying on your own actions. It's the same problem just on the other side of the, of the pendulum. The gospel neutralizes those things. I say, I just need to be a good person. I just need to be a good person. Well, Ephesians 2, we read the first part of it earlier, how we're all dead in our trespasses. Verse 8 says, for by grace you have been saved through faith. By grace through faith. Yeah, but where's the part about working for it? Yeah, exactly. It's not there. It's not there. This is, he's very explicit too. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works. Why? So that no one can boast. Every time that you declare the gospel over your life, every time that you thank Jesus for his righteousness and the fact that you are, you, you, you are clothed in his righteousness, that you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, you are declaring humility in your heart and in your life, that it is not you that's accomplished something great, but it's Jesus that has. That's why we must be reminded of the good news of Jesus all the time. Because as we deviate away from that, there's the same traps that are set every time, which is in some way, shape, or form, I'm either not worthy or I'm too worthy. Right? And it's like, put that aside. Jesus is worthy. Worthy is the lamb. So if you're walking in uh, condemnation or if you're walking in guilt today feeling like you're not worthy of God's grace, that's a lie. And if you're feeling today, really, there's a pep in your step because you had a really good week this week, right? And that you feel like you've attained some sort of level of spirituality today, like, like God loves you more this week than he did last week, be careful because that cliff is coming. I've been doing so good for six months. Just wait. All of your accolades that you, that you tell yourself all the people who have been saying, hey, you're doing so good. Yeah, I have. I'm, I'm, I'm doing good. <laughs> Just wait till you do bad. It's going to test how much you, how, what the revelation of grace is in your heart. You will still experience conviction, and that's good. But you're not going to feel like you've walked away from the Father. Right? You're secure in him. All right. What happens if they stay in this place, this phase? What happens if a person who, is, who falls into some of these categories, a person who, maybe, maybe you yourself, you would say, I'm, I'm spiritually dead, right? Now, I'm, I'm not a lot, I don't, I don't, I can tell already. Like, I might not be 100% what that word was, and, but, that, but for sure, that's, that's definitely where I find myself. What happens if a person or yourself stays in this phase of being spiritually dead? Number one, that person will never become spiritually alive. And it's pretty obvious in one sense, but it needs to be said. 
somebody remains in that place, they will never be spiritually alive. Number two is that they will remain eternally separated from God. Hell. They will remain eternally separated from God. Now, at this moment, there should be two things that we feel. If you find yourself in a place that you feel like you are spiritually dead, there should be a sobriety that just entered into your heart that says, oh, okay. Now, you might be combating that with, yeah, well, yeah, what, but the afterlife, come on. <laughs> you might be, might be thinking that. Others of you, you believe in the afterlife. You believe in something because you're a spiritual person, but you also know that you're not in one of, you're not, you're in one of those categories, unfortunately, and, and so right now, you're like, I believe in the afterlife, but what is it? And how do I know that I'm not gonna be in the bad place? So you're wrestling with that. Then for those of you who are in Christ, believers, faithful believers, the, the thing that you should be feeling is an urgency, a sobriety around, about the fact that this is real and that there are people all around you, friends and family, who are in danger of this. And as we get used to that danger, all of a sudden it doesn't feel like a danger anymore. As you have just become friends with those people who don't believe in Jesus, over the years you've lost the heart for the fact that they, and if you, maybe you've lost the fact if you even believe that what happens if they stay in this phase where they reject the gospel? You've like lost the mindset that you actually believe they're gonna be in eternity apart from God. So we should feel that sobriety. And, and the crazy thing is, God has put you on this earth to be his mouthpiece, to be his ambassador to those people that are in your life. What happens if we don't steward those opportunities well? I feel like I'm gonna stand before God one day. That's, this is how I live. Not with condemnation, but with, it motivates me. What opportunities are around me right now that I am not stewarding well? That's convicting. I'm not gonna go into the story. I've said it recently, but had a friend a couple of years ago who far from God, never read the Bible, didn't know anything, didn't know who Moses was. Like I'm talking, you know, far from God. And we, uh, we began to study the Bible together. Me and a couple friends began to study the Bible together. And uh, after about a year of studying the word, year and a half, uh, he was killed in a motorcycle accident. And the, the shock of that, it just, it opened my eyes to the reality of what's going on. And, and you're like, well, you're a pastor. You should have that reality. No, I'm a human being. And whenever you're around stuff a long time, God will use anything to break things in you to open your eyes to the reality of what's going on. And so now when I look around, I'm like, man, who, God, who, who else is in my life right now that I'm, that I'm so, like, say something to that person. Don't live in fear, speak out. You might not have the right answers, that's fine. God will use you, but there are people all around us. If we actually believe the word of God and what we're talking about, there's people all around us who are far from God, and if they don't come out of that phase, if they, don't, if they don't go from spiritual death to spiritual life, the word says that they will be apart from God eternally. So we should feel conviction, we should feel sobriety, we should feel urgency, we should just become aware. Some of you, you might not have 40 people in your life right there like that. Some of you are thinking right now about people that are outside of the church. Some, honestly, we need to disciple each other. Believers need to disciple each other, right? So it's, it, 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 there's a plethora of, of things here. Now, many people think that our culture doesn't believe in God or, or spirituality. There, there's a narrative in media that like everybody is agnostic or atheistic, right? I wanna tell you that that's a lie. That's a, that's a lie. Our culture is trending towards more spirituality. Why? Because we're at the end of our scientific, logical, like, we've, I mean, we figured so much out, but yet we're farther away from understanding even where we come from. Isn't it crazy? The further that the telescopes go, 
the further we're like, what is going on? <laughs> you know, I saw a picture this morning. It was a picture, it looked like sand. And it was just actually, it was just a picture of a galaxy, all the stars, uh, like way out there somewhere. The more that we discover, the more we discover we don't know what's going on. But there was a, a study done by Barna in 2022 that came out in 2023. And it said this, it said that 77% of people believe in God or a higher power. 74% of people say, I would like to grow spiritually. 44% said, I'm more open to God today than I was before the pandemic. What does that say? Look, man, when, when things start shaking, people start asking different questions, right? And so people are beginning to ask questions. They've lived a lot of their life, maybe in humanism or naturalism or whatever the case is. And now they're like, it ain't cutting it. Because it's not true. Truth, truth is stable. Lies are not. So people have grown up their whole life believing a lie and all of a sudden it gets tested and there's nothing to it. It's sand. So what do these people need from followers of Jesus? If you are a follower of Jesus in this place today, if you're watching online, if you're a follower of Jesus, what do these people need from you? Number one, to have authentic relationships with maturing believers. They need friends. Some of you right now, the number one thing that you could do to somebody that you know is far from God is just to be an authentic friend to them. First step. Number two, they need to see Christians living Christ-centered life. All right, not, not, not perfect, but forgiven. Pursuing Jesus. Like as, a, as a, an authentic friend in somebody's life, if, if you misstep, you should be the quickest to ask for forgiveness or the quickest to say, hey, I was, I was, that was wrong. That's different than a lot of people in this world, okay? <laughs> Number three, to have their questions answered. An, an unbeliever, somebody who's spiritually dead, they need their questions answered. Does that mean that you have every single question? I mean, every, every single answer? Probably not, but I guess, guess what you can do? You can go be a student, an apprentice, and you can go research or find or ask someone for explanation in something in order to help them work through that. That's how, y'all, that's how you serve someone. They ask you a question and you don't know the answer. That's okay. Don't get all weird about that. Say, hey, I don't know the answer to that. Let me go. I'll get back to you in a week. Yeah, go read the word. Go ask someone. You know what I'm saying? Help them have their questions answered and then they need to be taught the gospel. You should practice explaining the gospel to someone. You're in your car by yourself. I want you to begin to picture yourself talking to that person that you know is far from God and, and, and begin to, like, what questions would they ask and begin to answer those questions. Some of you, you have no confidence to talk to people about faith because you never practice it. You might be kind of weird in the car by yourself talking to yourself. They might think you're on speakerphone. Get over it. You know? Practice witnessing to people. Practice, you know what I'm saying? Some of you, that's the nugget that you need today. And then for those of you that say, I'm spiritually dead, what's my next step if I'm spiritually dead? Your next step is to simply hear and receive the gospel. To understand, to, to, uh, to ask God to reveal himself to you. To understand the gospel is to, to see and enter into the kingdom of God. You have to be born again by the spirit of God. John 3, that's right. We're gonna read John 3, 16 in a second. Come on, y'all. Wow. In John 3, Jesus talks to a man named Nicodemus. He's a Pharisee. He's a, he's a spiritual man, Okay. And he comes to Jesus and he has questions about what Jesus is talking about. He says, man, we could tell that you're from God, that you're teaching from, from God, the signs and the wonders you're doing, but there's a lot of confusion. So Jesus begins to break down what's going on. And man, come on, what would it be like for Jesus to explain some things to us today? Jesus answered him, said this, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water, come on, like natural birth, and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. We're all, everybody in this room, you've been born of the flesh. And that which is born of the spirit is spirit. 
All right? There's two different births here. He says, do not marvel that I... I'm going to give it just a second. It's all good. Some of y'all, that's how you feel right now. It's been an hour since that cup of coffee, and you're like, man... Verse six, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. And listen to what he says. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again, because he's getting hung up on that. He's like, don't, don't, don't get hung up on that. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the spirit. Some of you are like, give me logical explanation for what it means when someone is born again of the spirit. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Nicodemus is doing the same thing, and Jesus is like, bro, you don't even know where the wind comes from, where it goes. You don't really ask too many questions about that. that like, like, you're not gonna always be able to understand it and explain it in every single way. And some of you, that's what you're looking for. This is a spiritual thing, and not every spiritual thing can be explained in natural ways. We skip down to verse 16, though. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but those who believe in him will have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already. Because, why? Because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. Belief in Jesus. Trusting in Jesus. There's a part of it that we feel is something that we do. But the the first step is done by God sending his son. And, and, and it's, a, it's a free gift. It's what Ephesians said. So today, if in this moment you feel like I need to kind of attain something, I want you to hit pause on that, okay? And I want you to take your eyes off of yourself, take your eyes off of your circumstances, and I want you to, to simply think about Jesus, And don't weigh his grace for you based upon all of those other things, your past, your present, last night. Put that aside. The word says that Jesus did not come to condemn you, but he has come to save you. 